wants to do is. Right, sure. <laughs> Multi calls us to use more than ever, right? I think so. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It's kind of funny, but it's, it's a where's the noise? So, you know, we can't do that. Every new art can be changed. Well, can we get rid of it? Well, once it's well deployed, then it would only be a small proportion of the traffic. <laughs> um, I, uh, I was talking to the CTO that said he wanted to get rid of it because it was only like 10% of his traffic. And I mean, she said, "How much will it be removed? It's going to be 200% of your traffic." So I think we're going to we're going to need to come up with better statistics. I mean, really, you can make an argument for taking for taking the user taking the number of users watching a stream and multiplying that by the full path bandwidth and yeah, using that as your metric. Right. Like that's how much data you're delivering. We should write that draft. <laughs> well, actually, I, I actually wrote a grant for the University of China to do a model on this big track I had to just basically do in the structure, uh, you know, unicast in the structure. I wanted to be an AMT, like compare them all and just full, uh, full track. And we could drop in complete network designs. Uh, I just put <laughs> It was made viral then what we do on the on the mini pods we had. Then we dropped the mini pod and I lost all my support. This happens over and over again. Everywhere I play, they, they like take the toys away. Would you like to start shaming people into scribing? Uh we can. Gotta give you some uh finish words today. Uh I'm busy. Today. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can I can take it. Sure. Yeah, you're up for it. Uh, not this during is my cold, cold ask on my part. I know. Not, I'm not during my time. I'm good. Okay. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, you I'll, gotta cover it. I'll take your notes. Okay. Yeah. You, you're gonna do me. You guys are great. Okay. Yeah. All right. You, you actually. I've I've had too much beers. <laughs> he made eye contact with the wrong tone at the at the very looking down. The worst moment. <laughs> <laughs> actually. Jake just told me that worked outside before the meeting. <laughs> I walked up and hit him. You, uh, that's cold, man. I'm so yeah, sorry. I owe you beers for years. That's the worst show ever. <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> yeah, you had to show that it worked, too. You couldn't just watch it. Oh. It's all good. It's all good. This is the way it works. We need minutes. We can't. We can't, this plane cannot take off without <laughs> someone doing the safety lecture and the, uh... No, we're at it. We got minutes. Yeah, so we're good, right? Yeah. Uh, do we want to wait another minute? We're kind of in the corner here, and maybe people are on their way converging, so... When we go outside with a megaphone, we'll do a hauler down the street. Just, we just grab them violently and pull them in. You know, it seems like Multicast should have, like, a, you know, 1920s hauler or something. Just oh, kind of vaudeville stage with this little horn. Come on, come yeah. on. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Every man a presenter. <laughs> Everyone's a winner. Come on in. <laughs> hurry, hurry, hurry. Yeah. <laughs> It's Thursday now. It's Thursday. Right. So, yeah, yeah. We have to have more attendees than we have presenters. I was actually looking for this. I was actually looking for your You should be No, it wasn't taps. It was like this. I can't use this. I can't use this. Oh, the box is in the ground. Oh, yeah. 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 Like the Simpsons, it's like, it's like it's masks going on, and it's like, oh, I'm so glad someone showed but up I, I, during the Grand Master and Super Bowl thing. Oh my god, the game is wrong! <laughs> <laughs> Even though every time I say Simpsons, Simpsons. 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 Um, welcome to MBONE D. Get to know your neighbor. Introduce yourself to everyone. Um, hopefully, you're all meant to be in MBONE D. Uh, here's the note. Well, uh, you probably haven't seen this yet, but um, it uh, actually can be read in iambic pentameter. Um, 
Yes. Yeah, that's a fun fact. It was written in iambic pentameter. Um, please note it well. Uh, here's our agenda. Um, and I think a lot of the folks in here are going to be presenting. So um, would anyone like to bash this agenda? I don't think we have a whole lot of... I think it's lovely. A whole lot of uh, potential controversies on this agenda. Okay, so uh, let's get started with the status of the active drafts. Um, uh, the first two drafts, um, the Dryad draft, Jake's Dryad draft, uh, did just complete working group last call. It is in the hands of the shepherd, and we would like to thank Tim, uh, Tim Chown, for... Um, uh, volunteering to shepherd that one. Um, the MCAST problems draft uh, did complete work last uh, working group last call with um, there were some minor revisions. Um, we'd like to kind of go through. Uh, Charlie's going to provide an update on all the changes that were made. Most of them were textual. Some were, you know, everything was minor, but there were a few additions. Um, and let's decide if we think we need another working group last call for that one based on those last uh, few changes that were made. Um, and uh, whenever that's ready, though, because um, it did seem to com successfully complete, uh, we had enough support for it to, to move on. Uh, thank you to Jake for volunteering to be the shepherd of that one. Um, next, we have two drafts that are in active working group last call. So here is an opportunity, here's your opportunity uh, as a reminder um, to please uh, provide feedback if you support or do not support working group, uh, the advancement of these documents. Um, please speak up. Uh, we're running that um, last call for the next few weeks, but we wanted to run it through IETF uh, so that we could remind everyone in the room that, hey, here now would be a good opportunity to, uh, if you forgot to send, hit the send button on your email that you uh, have feedback on these drafts. Now's the time to do it. Um, the last active work uh, uh, draft uh, is the Yang models. Um, and Sandy wanted me to bring this one up uh, because she is, she is looking for feedback as well. Um, is this ready for working group last call? Um, first, uh, what 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 is the uh, Stig or or Warren? What what exactly is the process for the Yang doctors? Do we send it to them after working group last call? Do we send it to them for feedback uh, prior? How, how does what are we supposed to do? What's the interaction? Uh, Stig, so you can actually go in the data checker and request a Yang doctor review. Okay, you can do that before before last call if you want. Okay. Asking. Earlier, I think it's for good, so you can find any issues. Yeah, in case fix it now. Yeah, the earlier, the better. Cool. Um, while you're up, Stig, uh, I, I'm guessing you have the highest per percent likelihood of actually have read, read this. Um, have you read it? Do you have any thoughts? I, I have read it, um, but I feel like, I don't know, I'm not that much involved with Yang myself, so mm. it's kind of hard for me. And I'm afraid it's the same problem with most people in the working group that we don't maybe know Yang that well. Okay. Uh, and also, though, you know, ideally there should be operators. So they were saying, does this model include what we need? But um, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, so we need more uh, provider input um, on this one. Yeah, Jake Holland. Um, I asked Sandy about this uh, because my opinion was basically, if it works, it looks okay to me. I read it also. Um, and she said that, yes, they've been running it and it's in it's uh, in testing. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know how to incorporate that feedback into the consensus process, but mm -hmm. I feel like that is the, you know, if it actually works for deployed systems, then we probably should rubber stamp it and get this out the door. Steve again. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, it's possible that it doesn't include everything that ideally should be there, but we can always, if we find stuff that is missing later, we can always revise it or mm -hmm. extend the model. There's no harm in uh, 
maybe okay. starting with a, just the so, basics. So now's a good time to request Yang Doctor Review, I guess. Okay. We will note that. Um, I'll revise that. Yes. I, I don't. Please go back and uh, doctor the. Yes. Yeah. Make sure those are all in the minutes. Yes. Please doctor the notes so that it doesn't say <laughs> <laughs> the cynical things that we mean. Uh, other docs. Uh, there's the Ambi draft. Um, and uh, Jake, anything you want to say about this, or will this be covered a little bit in your hackathon update? Yeah, Jake Holland. Um, I have not implemented this yet, but uh, but that is the plan. It's going to be necessary. It will. I, I will touch on it briefly in my hackathon update. I'd be happy to take questions about it, and I, I think I'll have. My slot has plenty of time then, so I'll, yeah, please. Uh, it, it is, I'll just say it is still highly relevant and will be coming up again. Great. Okay. Moving right along. So we will start with uh, okay. Human. Uh, put together this slide deck. He is not here, unfortunately, uh, but he wanted... Stig, would you like to speak to this, or shall I? Um, could if you want to. I've been discussing it with him, and I also spoke to Ayana earlier today. Um, take, take to the pink X. <laughs> Look how aware he is. Isn't he aware? Uh, all right. I haven't seen this slide, so. <laughs> All right, so mTrace version 2 was published as an RFC recently, and we got a UDP port number from IANA. Um, but then it turns out that that port number is in a range used by Traceroute on Linux, and I think on some other Unix operating systems as well. So, the, um, I'm not sure how much I need to explain, but basically Traceroute uses like 100 ports or so. But they only got one port assigned from IANA, which is in the port registry. Uh, the, the, the port numbers coming after that, the next several hundred ports were just marked as unassigned. And mTrace was the first application or service that got a port number in that range. Um, and the problem we are seeing now is mTrace is actually working just fine. But if someone does a trace route, uh, what trace route does is, uh, I think it's like the first packet has like the lowest port number, the next one with a higher TTL has the next higher port number and so on. And then you, um, you expect from routers on the path to get an ICMP message back because there's nothing listing on that port. And you can then mark the TT, show the, the round trip time and stuff to that router. But if, something like mtrace is listing on the port, then there's no ICMP message coming back, and it will just show up as a star and kind of like time out and trace route. So the problem here is not really mtrace, but trace route is sort of broken. Is there, is there any spec for this uh, trace route? Right? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Uh, there's just okay. lots of implementations. Wow. <laughs> 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 yeah, Kyle Rose, is there, who maintains Traceroute, or is it just kind of like dead code? That's... <laughs> right, no, I mean, it is it is being maintained. Um, so I'm not sure, I, you know, this, it's been around, of course, for decades, and there's probably several implementations, and some of them are maintained, some are not. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering if... if uh... If it's been do if it's had this behavior for long enough, it's sort of like grandfathered in. Yeah. yeah. So, but then it would be up to us to basically 
I don't know. Can can we make sure Ayana reserves this? I mean, okay, right. we get a different port. Yeah. So I spoke so to. Unless we get a different port, we're not going to say anything because first we want to have M trace work, but yeah. uh, then basically Ayana needs to block this. Record. Yeah. So I can Be comment on that. Before we go that far, so I have a Name. question, uh, Lenny uh, Giuliano, um, <laughs> Juniper. So here's what I don't get. I mean. Windows doesn't do this. Windows sends an ICMP echo reply and with a TTL. And the important part is it sets it with a TTL and it expects a TTL expired. The fact that Unix is sending it with a, TC, with a UDP port and a different port, what does it matter? It's waiting to hear back. Why, why isn't it behaving the same way, which is I can pick out any port I want. It doesn't need to go anywhere. It's the ICMP uh, yeah. TTL exceeded message that comes back. The, Why the does this break? So the problem is, um, um, let's see. Yeah. Um, so this is the question I had for Human, and yeah. he wasn't sure either. He said just he was aware of an implementation that this was breaking, but to me, I, it's it's not clear. Let them squat on these ports. Do, do these ports matter? Yeah. It's, so it's at least, yeah. yeah, at least I can say some implementations like Windows, I believe, only use a single port number. Uh, but I know, for instance, on the next day, for some reason, they use a different port for the different distances. So, Warren Kamari, as far as I understand, Unix uses multiple port numbers because otherwise you have to send one trace route packet, wait for it to come back, send the next one, wait for it to come back. If you spread it across multiple port numbers, you can fire a bunch of them and get your response as fast as what I'd understood. Whatever the case, Traceroute has been around for so long and is so widely implemented according to the Unix way that I don't really think we can say, you know, all implementation should go off and fix themselves. Yeah. There's equipment that's been deployed for so long that yeah. I think we kind of, in fact, I think that uh, Juniper, for example, does their trace routes using multiple port numbers as an example. Um, Simon, I think the right thing to do here is be like, oops, we're going to have to move and then ask Ayana nicely to yeah. please block off all of these. Right, so I spoke to Ayana in, in the break here um, and a comment before that or? You know, I, I, I have to ask somebody who knows better, but I thought there was also something related when you go through a net and a firewall or so. But so I think Kumari's uh, yeah, no, I'm sure there are some reasons for this. But, but yeah, I spoke to Ayana in a, in a break and um, they were saying, yeah, it should be possible for us to get a different port number. Um, we may need our AD to sort of approve of it or something, I'm not sure. But but the, I guess though, if you were to change the port number, it means that we need to update the existing RFC maybe even obsolete it to make sure that people don't implement the old one with the wrong port number. I don't know. But we need a new RFC at least with a new port number. And and then uh, ask Ayana to filed? update the registry. Is errata been filed? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, so the first thing is file an errata. But it's not really an errata. It's, well, it's not errata yet. Well, yeah. oh. No, it's an errata in so far that it doesn't work, right? I mean, at least that's yeah. how... No, mtrace works. It's trace route that breaks now. Okay, all I'm saying is we have process to create visibility. I would be yeah. more worried about making sure there's okay. visibility than whether or not it yeah. 100% matches the intended process. Yeah, yeah. I mean, wow, static. Um, something similar Stories. kind of happened in, sorry, Warren Kamari still. Something similar happened with HomeNet where there was some advice which turned out to not necessarily be great. I'm not saying that that's what happened here, but I think the right thing to do is to file an errata Errata can't be used to actually update an RFC, and so it would have to be rejected or mock for document update, but at least we can point at it and there's some warning. Yeah. Um, and then at the same time, there should be a new RFC, like a new draft which can move to RFC really quickly being like identical to the last one with the string change. So we would need a new RFC. We couldn't just use errata and no. just say, I changed the port through that. I wish you could, but I think it's going to be, a yeah. but it should just go through the process really easily, especially if the only thing that's changed is one thing there and it should be already fast. Yeah. And then we could also ask the RFC editor to do expedited processing because it should be a single number change <laughs> and maybe like a paragraph explaining why. why. Yeah. Yeah. 
it's unfortunate. But. Jay Cohen, do we know how to avoid colliding with the next port we choose? No comment, but um, I guess we can Google it. And, you know, do a man on yeah. trace route and yeah. see what, what. But yeah, the other thing, uh, the other thing Ayanna said is uh, we can report that you know that they are kind of like using some unallocated ports uh, that trace route is, and and they can they can kind of block it internally so they don't accidentally give those port numbers to others. Mm. But ideally, they would prefer if we can find someone from the trace route community, or whatever, that can, uh, you know, sort of officially request Answer the full for range for trace route discretions. They you can yeah. send the know where to send Iana to send the Iana police. And yeah, booted thugs. To right. Yeah. But yeah, we can just find I know like the maintainer or who who last made a change to Linux trace route or whatever and, and oh. yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. All right. And 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 ports are within jurisdiction, I assume. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I feel safer. <laughs> it's good to know we've got somebody on the beat. So all right, so I guess the, the plan is we will file errata and then we will reach out to IANA to uh, tell them what's going on and then we will resubmit a new. Yeah, I guess do you, you need. What we're doing. You need someone to volunteer to write a new draft, I guess. I guess the old, the, the office of the old draft or whatever. Well, we've got Hitoshi here and. You saw that document from for a long time, um, so I assume you you might want to be involved in this one as well. Um, so this this should be the easiest revision you've ever made to that draft. <laughs> after I believe it was eighteen versions, or were we in the low twenties? It was it was yeah twenty six. Twenty six. All right. Well. And here I said 26th time is a charm. Apparently I was wrong. Okay. Okay, next up is Charlie. Charlie, are you online? I'm here. Can you hear me? Barely. <clears throat> well, let's see. How's that? Is that any better? Each time you speak, it's a little bit better. All right. Well, um, I'm not sure what more I can do. Let's see if I, well, that's about yep, it. You're good. Okay. You're good. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I'm Charles Perkins, and I'm here to uh, describe the changes since the last IETF for the uh, multicast considerations over IEEE 802 wireless media. Um, so I guess next slide, please. Or is that something I can do to change the slides? No. Okay. Currently there's All right. Well, um, so after the, gets after the last IETF uh, and during the discussion in the IETF, there are quite many comments. Some of them were generated at the hackathon, and uh, after that, uh, I submitted uh, revision number five on um, April 15th and requested uh, working group last call. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a, a list of the, some of the changes. Uh, there was a new section. Uh, essentially, Jay Collin just gave me the, the text for conversion of uh, multicast to unicast and included uh, AMT as an existing solution and uh, described some uh, future applications that would emphasize the need for attention to the technical matters that are described in this document. Uh, th there were several places all, all along in the text that were uh, generic to sort of, I mean, that needed to be more generic instead of referring to uh, specifically IETF conference solutions. And so that those have been sort of caught 
uh, more and more over time. And I, I hope it's all done, but uh, it could still be interpreted perhaps um, in a too specific way, some places. But uh, uh, added UP, UPNP, um, universal plug and play, is a representative multicast protocol and cited uh, the bridging code for people who wanted to uh, convert multicast to unicast. And then uh, there's a lot of bibliographic citations. And actually, there's more updates are needed, uh, which I'll get to that a little later. And then more uh, editorial improvements and grammatical corrections. The next slide, please. So that was uh, uh, submitted on April 15th. And then there was some more discussion uh, on the mailing list. It's been some really good discussion. Um, Jeffrey Zhang made a comment about, um, um, I think it was a super user uh, web page that had a lot of discussion about the problems in this draft and mentioned uh, some more things that hadn't been considered, uh, specifically about how uh, wireless failures can really complicate problems with multicast group membership. So uh, the way of handling that comment was to update the security considerations and really uh, ended up just sort of uh, summarizing some of the text that was on the web page. The other uh, big uh, change that was done was really there was a lot of comments from uh, Bill Atwood, who made a, a extremely uh, detailed and appreciated view, review of the document. And he also suggested included, including Dryad as a relay discovery uh, possibility. Uh, next slide, please. So then that uh, all those things resulted in um, submitting uh, uh, revision number six. Um, I think that was done in the early part of July. So. Uh, uh, there was, as I mentioned, new tech in the security considerations and uh, also including Dryad as a discovery mechanism. And uh, I actually did an English refresher course learning about when to use which versus that and, and uh, amount versus number and a few other things. And then more bibliographic updates and editorial improvements. Uh, next slide, please. Well, since then, uh, there's been some more uh, email from uh, Bill Atwood pointing out a few other things that need to be taken care of, and plus email from Jake Holland. And interestingly enough, Jake is arguing that Dryad should not be listed as a discovery mechanism uh, because it's really uh, useful from the uh, remote side. And also a few other minor corrections on the draft. So. That's pretty much it, what I have for now. Um, the next uh, document, I, I thought I would try to get it out this week, but that didn't really happen. And anyway, it's probably better to wait to see um, if there's any additional comments uh, during this face-to-face uh, -face meeting, or let's say almost face-to-face. -face. So uh, next slide, please. So that's uh, what I just said. I will uh, uh, produce a new draft uh, quite soon. And if there's any additional reviews, oh, and by the way, I guess a special thanks to uh, uh, Warren Kumari for motivating people to submit some reviews for the draft. That was very helpful. So that's it for my presentation. And I'll be happy to answer questions. But I just want to mention that uh, sometimes, yeah, I think you have to be close to the mic because sometimes the uh, uh, echoes in the room make it hard for me to hear what you're saying otherwise. Great. Thank you, Charlie. Um, so I, I think given the changes you've described, um, I think after you get that last, that, that uh, next rev out, um, I think we should have a, a brief, uh, another working group last call because these are, you know, some substantive uh, additions. So. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll run another uh, quick last call just so that folks have an opportunity to review what the changes have been made uh, and make sure there's no objections to those changes. Okay, well, that's fine with me. I also would just mention that I try to be uh, somewhat inclusive in the uh, changes section in the, in the uh, appendix. 
So you can take a look at that and get a hint about what's been changed. Yeah. Warren Kamari, absolutely no hats. Um, <clears throat> if you do another, or well, when you do another working group last call, is it going to be one where you expect replies or will silence be taken as consent or how do you want to run it? Just last time it was really hard to get any comments. Uh, I would be fine with doing silence uh, equals consent. Can um, can the AD uh, thumbs up that one? <laughs> Assuming the AD does not object to that. Probably not because this AD isn't responsible for this document. Okay. Um, I mean, if it's already gone through one working group last call, I think yeah. that chairs have the flexibility to say, you know, this is the changes. Does anybody object? Yeah. In the past, but yeah. That's that's how we'll frame it. Yeah. Please speak up uh, if you have any objections to these changes. So, so Charlie, um, when you do submit it, uh, send to the working group just kind of maybe a diff uh, between that 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 shows um, specifically, so the folks don't have to dig hard, um, but that they can specifically see the new text that was added since the original working group last call. And that way, it's easy for people to review. And if they have an objection, they can speak up. OK. Uh, when was the original working group last call made? Was it like a month ago? It was a while ago. I would say something like uh, the beginning of May. OK. So then I'm going to, in order to satisfy your request, I'll include all the changes from draft five up to draft seven. Sounds good. Okay. Well, that's it for me. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, and thank you very much to the Meet Echo crew. It's really uh, very good. Thanks, Charles. Yeah. Thank you, John. Okay, Kyle, come on down. Take to the X. <clears throat> the pink X. Closer. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kyle Rose. I work at Akamai Technologies, and I'm, this is uh, work that I'm doing with Jake uh, that is intended for multicast. So um, I'm, I'll set up the problem. This actually works. Oh, excellent. You. All right, so I'll set up the problem here. So uh, the, the issue is being able to authenticate all of the packets that you receive in a possibly lossy stream. There we go. So uh, in, say, video delivery, for instance, which is kind of the target uh, application for this, uh, they, the, uh, the data that's received has some properties that are important. First is that the payloads have a deadline. If you don't receive a particular payload by a certain point, then you might as well just throw it away. You may as well not, not have gotten it at all. So in some sense, retransmits are not, are not interesting. The other problem, the other big problem is that, uh, is that with uh, multicast video delivery, there are many receivers. So one of the things that TLS relies on for efficiency in its uh, in its encryption is that it only uses asymmetric crypto to negotiate a symmetric key. And the symmetric key is then known only to the sender and the receiver, or you know they're known. It's known to each peer. So if you didn't originate a message encrypted and signed with that symmetric key, you know that the other party did, and you know uh, not notwithstanding key exfiltration attacks and whatnot. Um, the other problems with uh, with video that are or with with uh, um, unreliable delivery are uh, that datagrams are lossy um, and that uh, retransmits are not appropriate because in multicast you're not. I mean, how would you how would you retransmit a multicast packet? Right, you'd have to you'd have to have it transmitted to you via unicast. You need some signaling mechanism, and you don't even know who the sender is most of the time. So. So the uh, the naive solution to this is to sign individual packets, right? So you have you send you know you divide your video into uh, into individual packets. You leave enough room for a signature. You sign it using an asymmetric signature algorithm, and you append that to the packet. So the pros for this approach, being the naive approach, is that you can verify every packet that you receive. The big con here is that it's very CPU it's very CPU intensive for receivers. It may also be CPU intensive for the sender, but that's not the case that I'm targeting because typically the sender is also, the sending infrastructure is also involved in video encoding, which is much more uh, CPU intensive. But the client may have dedicated hardware for video decoding. It probably doesn't have dedicated hardware for doing some, for doing signature validation. So 
Tesla tries to solve this problem not by using asymmetric crypto, but it introduces asymmetry by doing a by holding back the key, the symmetric key that is used to sign the packets and releasing it after it expects all the receivers have received the packets that were signed with that key. Right. So essentially, as you can see in the diagram here, there are three packets that were signed with a uh, key K1. There's a deadline at which all receivers must have received that key, and then it releases key K1, and the receivers can use it to verify the packets. Then it has to use a different key for any subsequent packets. Uh, this is a this is a good scheme in certain circumstances, but it does have some it does have some cons. Uh, the big one is that it requires weak clock synchronization, and while this works well in uh, in controlled environments. In adversarial environments, you run into you run into problems where the uh, where attackers can delay packets used for clock synchronization, um, and uh, and therefore cause receivers targeted receivers to process packets that they wouldn't otherwise have processed. Um, the other the other big problem that we have is that uh, if you try to use this interdomain by using say NTP, well even with even with NTS, which hasn't even been standardized yet. I don't know that I, as an as an enterprise, or I as a as a, uh, a, a CDN uh, employee would want to trust NTP as a security mechanism for the streams that I'm publishing. So once the key has been released, all bets are off, and any receiver can then can then uh, inject a packet signed with K1 to any to any other receiver that is still willing to accept them. I told the secretary, sorry. If we have enough time, and I, I still didn't get the, the the trick of the security thing. I mean, for an invalid receiver who's not meant to be able to decrypt this, how how does the scheme protect against that if the key is transmitted? So this isn't this isn't an encryption scheme. This is an authentication scheme. the The idea is that is that the the publisher. I mean, and this is not the algorithm that I'm that I'm talking about in the rest of my talk, right? But the idea here is that is that in order to keep a one of the receivers, which in order to authenticate the signature has to know K1 from injecting packets into the stream, it can it cannot get K1 until after all the packets have been received. Yeah, sorry, I should have made that I should have made that clear. <laughs> okay, no problem. Yeah, here. If you have time, I will put in a little question, I guess. I'm kind of wondering, do you really need to rely on NTP? Couldn't you say that this key is valid for whatever you received within the, the, the previous few hundred milliseconds or something? I mean, do you need to use like kind of... Well, the problem is that, that an, an attacker that is trying to target you can delay the can delay the packets in a way that causes you to authenticate something that you wouldn't have authenticated if it were just if it were expected network delay. I don't want to get too far into analyzing this, though, since this is I, I'm sort of where I'm going with this is that there are situations in which you really do want asymmetric crypto to provide your asymmetry. So one approach that I tried, and we actually went to Sec Dispatch with this a year ago, um, was a signed manifest. So essentially, you send a bunch of payloads, and then every so often you have a manifest that is signed, and this manifest contains hashes of all the payloads that you sent previously. So the pros of this is that it's lots of lots of fast hashes, only one signature per you know n packets. Um, but the cons are, well, what if you lose the manifest? Well you know, you can send them multiple times, but you're still going to lose some of them. And when you lose a when you lose a manifest completely, all of the packets that it signed are now unauthenticatable. And so you may have some huge cap gap in your video. Um, the other problem is kind of a conceptual problem, uh, which is that the which is that the fate of the authentication information is separate from the fate of the data payloads. So you can receive all the data payloads and not receive the authentication payload. And that would be a perfectly normal situation to expect on the internet. Uh, and in that case, all of the data you received is now useless because you can't verify it. So a different approach is to use chained integrity, right? So here you have a series of, a series of packets where each packet contains the hash of the previous packet. And then occasionally you have a signature 
that allows you to, that acts as the uh, as the trust anchor for that sequence of packets. So the pros of this are again sparse signatures. You only have a signature every so often, and there's tolerance for signature loss because if you lose this signature, you just have to wait for the next one as long as you receive all the packets in the meantime that form a chain back to whichever one you haven't been able to uh, haven't been able to authenticate. The problem with that is that one loss breaks the chain, so so it's it's not tolerant to loss in a way that is interesting. But it is better in some sense because the authentication information is uh, does share fate in, in in a limited way with the data that's being transmitted. So a slight refinement to this is to have redundant integrity, right? So here you have two hashes. So essentially every packet contains the hashes of the two prior packets. So this gives you essentially two ways of getting to of getting to any packet. Um, so you have two chances to get a packet hash. If you, you'd have to lose two in a row in order to break the chain. But that's still not good enough because you really just, instead of having a loss rate of P, you now have a loss rate of P squared, which is still fairly high, presumably in, uh, you know, when you're, when you really want to be loss tolerant. And this can be a lot more often if loss is bursty, which it often is, where you will lose multiple packets in a row. So really what you want is redundant integrity that is patterned in such a way that it is resistant to expected patterns of loss. And this is what, uh, this is what we implemented. So uh, during Sec Dispatch last year, Ecker just like out of the blue remembered some paper from like, you know, 17 years prior that described a solution to the exact problem we were, we were having. And this is the Gole and Motodugu paper. This provides a DAG of hashes with periodic signatures. The, the, so in, in this diagram, uh, the, the arrows are directed in such a way that, that a hash of a packet is contained within the, the packet at the end of the directed arc, right? So, so in this case, for instance, um, the hash of B0 would be contained within the packet A4. Right? I'm not going to go through this. Believe it or not, it's a DAG. Uh, this is actually a simplified version of what, is, of what the algorithm is actually doing. But it, it's, it's a little bit complicated to read the paper to understand how to do, how to do the construction. But it's actually fairly easy to implement the construction because they almost provide a, an algorithm in the paper itself. So one of the pros here are that you, you always get two chances to get each packet hash, but they're better distributed in such a way that even if you lose both packets that are that contain a hash of one of the packets in the stream, you are very unlikely to lose many other packets as well because there's additional redundancy. There are many ways to get from a signature to any particular packet. And I've proved this with, uh, with some running code. Uh, the cons are it's complicated, as I said, and there's also a variable number of hashes per packet, which means that your uh, the data that you're transmitting, you must be able to segment it into uh, into variable length pieces, which might be a problem for some payloads, but uh, not for the use case that Jake and I are working on. So the key properties of this are that it has optimal resistance to bursty packet loss. There's a nice proof of this in the paper. And as I said, it has tolerance for signature loss, just like the, the other chained algorithms, uh, because you can just wait for the next signature to come through. Uh, one of the other nice features there that, it, that follows on from that is that if your receiver is smart, it doesn't have to authenticate every signature. You can send more signatures than you expect the receiver to actually authenticate, and it can just skip some of them as long as it, as long as it knows it's going to get one eventually within its deadline. So the next steps are, uh, are running code. I have code that is running now. It's not public yet. I hope to make it public in the next like week or two. Um, just have to go through the legal department at Akamai. Um, and then there's a bunch of design choices that need to be made. Um, I put one issue in the, in the GitHub repo uh, that would be interesting to get some feedback on um, about opacity versus overhead. So. Uh, the way that I currently have it implemented, it is not parsable without access to out-of-band metadata that tells you how long specific fields are. Um, I don't know whether people feel strongly about making it parsable even without that metadata. 
And then just in general, we need to flesh out the draft. But uh, I'm curious if other people have, if people have questions or if they're interested in doing this work. Uh, totally separate again. So how, how or why is something like GMAC infeasible? Something like what? A GMAC, GCM, Galore counter mode for, you know, the, the built-in authentication that comes along with it. I'm not understanding the. I'm not so understanding if, the relevance. If I understand it correctly, the the whole point was to authenticate, right? So now, if the authentication comes for free with the crypto, we can look at the overall complexity of the system. GCM um, <clears throat> seems to be, you know, uh, something that that is said is working fairly, extremely fast in, uh, you know, uh, crypto hardware. So basically, uh, that if I haven't tried to analyze what it means, if you have lossy channel. But otherwise, the question really is, why don't we just use crypto with GCM? Because that's self-authentication. Yeah, I, 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 sorry, I'm not. I'm not sure how that's how that's relevant to to loss, right? So the issue, the no, the, the issue, yeah. the issue with the issue with authenticating a lossy stream is that if you if you don't include if you don't if you can't authenticate individual uh, 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 segments of data that you receive. And you need to have the whole, like all of the data in order to I, authenticate I think, it. I think you gave me the uh, the, the right answer faster. Well, I, oh. I, I looked on Wikipedia. <laughs> it says GCM is is metric. Right. Yeah. Okay. That too. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Anyone interested in using this or helping out with this? Again, Thanks, right? Jake. Uh, Jake's volunteered to help. So I had one thought, the one thing I'm wondering about, maybe stupid question again, but you know, you can do like a manifest, as you said, they'll say every five packets or whatever with signatures. So I was kind of wondering if you take that manifest of five packets, then you use some redundant coding of that and you include, you know, parts of that in each of the next five packets or something like that. So that's actually that's very similar to what Jake is proposing. So we were not actually uh, the way that we're the way that we are uh, intending to use this is not to actually put the video into this payload, but actually to use this stream to distribute a manifest, a rolling window manifest of hashes of video packets. Okay. Hmm. So. Uh, this, by the way, reintroduces the pro the problem Kyle mentioned about page sharing. Um, so I, I'm arguing we should live with that. But well, uh, it, it being a rolling window means that you'd have to lose an awful lot in a row. In which case, you are probably going to run into uh, you know a, a skip in your video anyway. That said, I my intent is to run the manifests at, as part of the same multicast group on a different port. So they they have some amount of fate sharing on, in the routing layer, but that's different. So I, I didn't really ask the stupid questions intentionally, but no, no, let no. me take them as a proof <laughs> that this. No, group... So you should you should take my response as I'm confused, right? Um, but let me let me take these Eckert guys. I'm I'm the one with the teeth, the stupid guy. The, the other one without the teeth. You know. um, <laughs> He's got so the. As a proof that this obviously is the best working group to be the specialist for new crypto or authentication mechanisms, right? So I think the best role that this working group would have is basically with anything it produces uh, supports the notion of, you know, the need, the requirement to do something like this. Because I would say the fundamental reason why, you know, a fast mechanism for asymmetric transmission like that exists a lot more in multicasting than unicasting. Mm -hmm. Right, because in 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 the in the unicasting way, kind of all these symmetric things have a lot of good solutions, whereas the asymmetric stuff is you know effectively reduced. And then basically here, your whole argument would be in multicast. We can't do it in the same way. Mm -hmm. We need the asymmetric stuff. So if basically this working group is required to produce something that says you really must do this, and then some other working group that really knows what crypto means. Um, would basically standardize whatever is needed in this case, right? But I mean, this is not a protocol work working group, right? So, and, and PIM wouldn't be a protocol working group either, right? This would have to go to whoever does authentication, encryption, 
or authentication encapsulation, right? I don't even know what it is at this time, but I think we could only create the requirement saying this is a cool thing and we really want to have something like this. Yeah, I, I think you're probably right. I kind of, I kind of, uh, I, I, I skipped part of the spiel that I had prepared and I probably should have included that, which was, which was, does it make sense for Mboni to take on this work? The reason I brought it here was that this is the group of subject matter experts about the application that we're planning to use it for. But do we need to reopen MSEC? Should I go back to SEC Dispatch? What is, you know, what are the next steps for this? Uh, Jay Collin, um, we took this to SEC Dispatch last time, and this is where we got the feedback. We're happy to do it again and to open a working group for it. Um, their feedback was that we need to get support. Um, so that's part of what we're doing here is this okay. being the, the application experts that can talk about the need for it. Uh, I don't know if it has to be like an informational draft declaring a need for it or if you can just show up to MSEC and raise your hand, or, uh, show up to SEC Dispatch and raise your hand at the right time. But one of those things might be useful, yeah. I don't know the security area well enough to say how they want to run their stuff, right? In terms of, to me, this looks like whatever ESP or whatever other stuff is define a new, you know, form of crypto profile for that, that would effectively do this stuff. I'm not sure about the additional complexity with the metadata or something, but um, I think it's very viable for them to say we need to, to, to see some interest. So the question is, what's the best type of interest we can express, right? So. So this is a this is I would a look to the chairs process. for guidance yeah. on this. So I would turn to the ADs for direction, but uh, what I've seen quite a bit in a lot of work, we cross boundaries all the time. Um, the interest is coming here. How do we show interest? Do we adopt it? That'll wake them up. I don't know. You know, <laughs> we finally push through the, the and ISGQ, you're going to get and then, so much more feedback on a document with crazy yes. new crypto stuff than for all these other documents yeah. you're doing here. Yeah, and advance it to the queue, and you'll get feedback. Wow, you're tall. <clears throat> um, to me, it does feel like having this discussion in a group that has a lot more crypto people would be much more valuable. Like. It seems as though there's enough stuff here that's easy to shoot ourselves in the foot with. Um, this is great. I just I don't disagree with you, but I think I would frame it differently. I wouldn't say more valuable. I would say additional value. Okay. The use case is just as important. They they don't see a reason to do it. We do. So together. Yeah. Right. So you know requirements are clear. Um, there's a solution here that may be enough. Even getting their sanity check on something is usually the case. When we cross boundaries, it's not often to throw it over the wall and have them do the work. It's just to ensure that those experts get a chance to review our work. Yeah. That's that I didn't say in every case, but that's often the case. Yeah. So not just review our work, but hopefully be involved in making sure as it progresses that it well, Yeah. Well, part of the review is say, no, this is a, a lame idea. We got a much, much better way of doing this. Did they understand the racks? And we go through the process, but there's a process. So I would, so one thing I would say is that as I've presented it here, there's nothing novel crypto wise there although there are some things that we would like to do that probably would uh you know probably raise the hairs on the on the you know the back of ben's head uh if we actually implemented them such as like truncating hashes right how much can we do that and still have a security margin right so that's the kind of thing where we would definitely need uh security area input well but don't don't you feel that uh you know um the amount of crypto review on, I mean, there is this metadata channel, which I don't know, right? So there were these parameters that you said, right? So I don't know anybody here who could, and, and, and that may impact whether you need a metadata channel or whether we feel, oh, we can just statically define a profile that will be fine forever. And then somebody comes around and says crypto agility. And so, I mean, there there's a lot more stuff, which, you know, I think uh, if we do it with review afterwards toward the end, right, we do, we do everything, working group last call, and then core issues come up, right? So I, I think it's fine to get started with this one block requirement use cases, one block proposed solution. Worst case, this is getting snipped in the middle and the solution goes to a, a working group that does it better, right? Thanks. Uh, anyone else? All right, thank you.
All right, Jake, come on down. Hi, Jake Holland, and uh, I was going to talk about the hackathon. And this uh, this will work. Yeah. All right. Um, so my focus at this uh, with this effort is about getting receivers deployed that can actually do the ingest. So the idea is uh, it is it broad deployment for something that's going to implement the discovery because the the new discovery that we're that we've recently passed uh, last call complicates the multicast application um, and making sure that it's going to be viable to get it in and the the crypto that we're that we believe is going to be necessary for the receivers also is going to complicate the application so i'm trying to merge this into a library and get this and and provide a proof of concept that it can be integrated and in fact go ahead and do some integration on some widely deployable clients um to that end i published a a, a libmcrx library um bsd licensed I have it running with basic SSM receive, and uh, it's compiling on Mac and Linux, and, and in fact, receiving data. Um, my intent is to add the AMT gateway with Dryad discovery with the local DNS SD discovery, so that the you know it's it's critical to the use case of uh, deploying multicast that we get that when you can discover a local relay, you use it so that a locally capable multicast network actually provides multicast. If you just connect to a remote relay, you will you will sort of ossify multicast before you can get the actual replication. It has to go over the access network. That's my that's my view of it. Um, you know, the the place you get the most gains is in those fiber networks and in the cable networks where you where there's physical bits on the wire that don't have to get transmitted because you did it in multicast. So that's what I'm trying to accomplish with this. And the other piece is that is the authentication which uh, you know, on the internet, we have to send over untrusted networks. And in, in actual deployment, it's going to be critical to get that working. That's why we've started this work. We're gonna try and make it run and it's gonna go into that library um, with the same API or a, a, a small extensions to the API that's there now for how to do the receive. On the application side, it will be relatively invisible. So at the hackathon, uh, over the weekend, we did. I got it running and integrated uh, in the upstream for the uh, HAP, for the Taps reference implementation. It's a Python implementation of Taps. Taps is is working on a, uh, a sort of replacement API for socket libraries. Um, so I've been participating with that group, uh, and I have now uh, integrated this multicast receive library into that reference implementation. It was running. Uh, it's it is research code, so this is not super deployable on its own. But it was heartening to see it, you know, be successful with the API that was there, um, and I think it does represent an, a worthwhile proof of concept. The other thing is the upcoming uh, idea, which is um, I have a prototype running, which uses the same API and runs under Chromium, providing um, a JavaScript. Uh, API, which you issue a join, and now you start receiving UDP payloads. Once we've integrated the discovery and the uh, and the authentication, this is going to mean that you're going to receive authenticated payloads, and you'll be doing it whether or not you have multicast capability. But if the uh, if the local network does provide multicast capabilities, then you would be getting it with multicast. So that's the basic idea. This also is running, um, and uh, it's going to need this is going to need a lot of work. Um, in fact, yes, this is my to-do list. Um, there's uh, th this is not going to be you know done in November. Um, I, I doubt it will be done in April. Uh, but I don't know. Depending if I can get any support, I I can type all of this. I think I know what to type. I think I know how to make this go. But it's uh, there's a lot of pieces to put together and uh, and. Before it can really be deployed, I think all of this or you know appropriate substitutes that simplify are going to have to be there. Uh, so yeah, um, if you know any grad students that want some good experience or that uh, 
you know, um, then I would love to hook them up. Uh, if people are interested in this, I would love to get some assistance on, on working this out. And, um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to start typing myself and I would love for people to come join me for friendly mentoring. Talk to grumpy old troll. Indeed. <laughs> What's their carrot? Uh, there's, it's a wonderful experience. You know what? Um, I'd have to talk to him. It depends on, I don't know. Let's dig. Uh, yeah. Hi. Um, just a thought, or maybe you've done this already. Um, is it possible to, um, you know, use, um, shared libraries, so like preloading so that you can have like a pre-compiled existing application using the socket API? And then they calling your AMT library. That is an interesting idea. Um, so the socket API is arguably a poor choice for some of this. You need to, you know, I'm using a socket API underneath it, of course. Um, it's not really cross platform. It doesn't work cross platform. There's different sock ops you have to do to actually issue the join. There's, um, you know, uh, you get a, um, you know, if you want to write that, that would be awesome. Yeah, so um, know, uh, <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't know how to write that one, actually. Right. I, I know on, on Linux, someone wrote some open source code like a decade ago that did something like this for SSM. So the application just joined StarG as usual, but then you had this library between the app and the kernel that could basically do an SCMD join for some other group. And right. So that's that's kind of what the, the role that this library is trying to fill. Um, you do have a, a relatively simple SSM join API. Um, and your uh, you know, the, the hope is that that the receive side use cases for applications actually can work with this app with this API and that that's going to be somewhat simpler than the than trying to use sockets. Um, that has been my experience with messing with it so far, I think it, you know, as as with all code, it will presumably get refined along the way. But yeah, yeah, there's a feeling that it could be possible to do something like that, but it would be, yeah, it's a brain. I don't know. Sockets are so yeah. like it, one of the lessons from Taps is that uh, the, the working group was formed because like three different groups tried to do this, not for the more complicated case of multicast with like extra features, but, but just for regular, you know, ease of use on sockets and, uh, ended up deciding actually this is kind of complicated and now they've been hammering at it for a couple of years and maybe they'll have a good API for long. Yeah. At least if you're interested, I could maybe point you to that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Please, please do send. I think it's 15 years old code. <laughs> Great. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you for maintaining a good multicast presence at all the hackathons. And uh, yes, you're doing the work of the Lord. Okay, we are. Leslie, come on down. And Glenn. So, uh, the media ops boff, uh, there was a media ops boff occurred Monday. Monday. Who here in this room attended? Okay. So, about a, pre -boff was. a third of the room. And this was uh, the first boff after the one in Chicago. <laughs> was that correct? There, I, rem I remember it's Chicago. The it's the first interest? formal boff. Okay. No, the bar boff. That was the bar boff in Chicago. I remember that. And there, there hasn't been anything uh, formal, but you've been, you've had the list going. And right. So we've somewhere. been we've we've been talking about video uh, at the ITF. Had an informal group over the course of the last two years. Yeah. Yeah. So since since Chicago, Chicago is kind of overwhelming with the number of people in the room. We went to a much smaller group, um, sort of less formal called the video interest group that's been meeting at every ITF uh, since then. 
Um, and uh, which has been pretty good because it's allowed the sort of the, the nascent ideas to sort of form and say, well, what would you work on? How would you tackle things? And I think we've developed a really good community of um, interested parties, both individuals and, and, and organizations that would support uh, the topic space. Uh, but now it's time to maybe make it a little more formal and do a little bit more. And that's why we called for the media ops boff to sort of open it up to the rest of the, the, the world. Um, so people who were in the boff have heard this part of the song and dance before. Um, so part of what we were hoping to do with that was to highlight the fact that there are many video activities that are ongoing at the IETF that don't actually fit in any one particular place um, and identify gaps in IETF work and areas of incompatibility with video technology development uh, efforts being carried out elsewhere. So for example, um, Glenn gave a presentation about the S the SMPTE dependencies on IETF standards. Um, there was um, representation from folks involved in the SVA, the Streaming Video Alliance in the room. Um, and these are all other organizations that use IETF standards in ways that might be surprising to us. Yeah, so on that, um, I, I, for people that live in the world of the IETF, they're probably not very aware of what's going on in some of the other orgs. Um, SMPTE is a Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers. Basically, they do TV and they do broadcast. Um, they do production. They, they they run studios. They do all that kind of fun stuff. Um, that whole industry, kind of like the tele telephony guys migrated, you know, and we had SIP. Um, they're migrating from uh, a protocol called SDI, which is a point-to-point -point protocol that they that all the gear is wired with, allows them to stream their streaming, uh, move content from sources to destinations uh, in studios and in production environments. Um, and then ultimately doing you know, a broadcast tower or a cable network. Uh, they're migrating to this thing called IP. <laughs> and they're, they're just discovering IP networks. And so one of the first things they did uh, was create this uh, suite of standards called 2110 uh, in their parlance, which essentially is how do you do all this kind of stuff we've regularly been doing over SDI? How do you do over IP networks? Uh, they learned a lot about you know updating their stuff to make it work in that environment. They also learned a lot about IP networks things that worked for them and things that didn't work for them. And so they, you know, one of the things we presented was this long list of normative references that they have back to us uh, in the ITF. Uh, and unfortunately, the director of standards, uh, Thomas Bowser Mesa, was supposed to be at the BOF, but he had to go to LA for a meeting at the last minute. Um, or he would have been able to give you a, a real good in-depth uh, overview on it. But the takeaway there is that there's these groups that are now, just like uh, Telephony guys did, they're starting to become dependent upon IP networks. And so part of the takeaway for me on this is that there is this new set of parties that are really dependent upon us and they're really interested in the stuff we do here. There's an opportunity here to fire up some work in the ITF and bring these guys in as well because they have stuff that they want to talk to us about. And it'd be possibly use some work, successful new work for the ITF, but also um, a way for all of us to make our TV shows and movies that we all love a little bit better. And I think Torlo says something he wants to talk to us about. Yeah, so I mean the example, so even a couple of years back, I've seen really crazy ways on how some of the broadcast equipment has been, you know, app using IGMP, even in the way they document it and their stuff. And, you know, we do have existing working groups where they could have come to, like this one or PIM or others, if they have any questions about the technologies that they're using. So I'm just wondering, you know, what's what's the process by really because we have we have adoption of IP technologies and all these different technologies for such a long time, and there have been always the ongoing pain that everybody who adopts it thinks they understand this stuff better so, than we do. So I think yeah. So I think part of the problem is that for the people who are working in those groups, if, even if they ever looked at an IETF schedule or at the IETF webpage, heaven forfend. Um, have, would have no idea where to plug in, right? I mean, maybe they would understand, well, I'm using V6 technology and I'm going to do it this way. I'll find, oh, look, here's a V6 working group. And it's like, none of the work items are relevant to what they're doing. So the point... I, I, sorry, I, can I interrupt? I don't believe this, right? Because, I mean, I've been uh, uh, help mentoring people as well who came in there. Somebody asked what the technologies are and then they've been asking around with a mentor who knows these technologies. I, I didn't say so nobody okay, succeeded. So agree to disagree. Yeah. and That's and, university work, man. These are people trying to get the job done. They get really paid to do it. They don't care. They find a solution and they go after it. They can't get a spec read and clarified in time. They do it the way they want to do it. No, no, I think we agree on that. What I'm saying is I disagree on the fact that somebody, if they wanted to come to the IETF, 
wouldn't be able to figure out where to go to because we're helping them with that. So, so one of the problems is that you you actually stand up in a working group and you say, "Here's this problem," and you get told you that there isn't a problem. Sort of like now. Well, well, and, and yeah, specifically to this point, you know, as me as an ITF or when I go and work with my colleagues in these other groups, which I'm a member of SIMPTI, uh, and I'm on the board of the Streaming Video Alliance, I will tell you I've received vocal feedback many a time from people who have tried to come in and engage with us. We do have a bit of a reputation of not being the friendliest crowd to open the door and welcome people in. Part of the idea that behind this is it could provide a safe video, um, a group that understands video concerns, also understands the ITF, and could help bridge them into it. So how that might work in practice, for instance, would be, hey, I've got a problem that's video related that I think touches IP networks, okay? First step. Step number two, I would like to find a bunch of like people at the ITF who understand this problem space and who would work with me to create sort of an essence of IDs that could eventually either create work in this space or could get taken over into another working group that's working on the specific stuff such as mbone D uh, once those ideas are allowed to be developed and refined so that they're ready to be brought into a group like MBO D or some other group within the ITF. By the way, time it turns out to be is a huge new topic for a lot of these video guys. Uh, who, who knew, right? Um, but they have faced that exact problem. How do you make those ideas uh, coit before you bring them forward and, and into those working groups? And I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to imply that nobody succeeds in bringing their stuff in. I think that you've you're identifying that you have successfully helped bring some people in and and sort of smooth their their access to getting the right answers. Um, and and we're saying there are some people who don't succeed. Maybe they haven't found you, but I mean. The point is there are people for whom this doesn't work. And I think the gentleman behind you would like to make a remark. Hi, Femi Kamala for Arista Networks. I agree. I think this is very much needed. I know from talking to customers in the kind of media world that even a concept like an IP address is quite kind of scary to them. And they always want to try to avoid a lot of the kind of technical details. So I think what you're suggesting makes a lot of sense and okay. very useful. Um, so in terms of trying to do this this type of work, some of the challenges we outlined were the fact that this video work is multifaceted, covers a lot of traditional areas, no clear single home for it, um, and therefore uh, some coordination would be useful as Glenn was just outlining. And so we kind of wound up in the ops space for the BOF in part because it's not there's not specific proposals for developing specific technologies at this point, but rather uh, more a set of operational issues that people are uh, encountering and finding solutions or creating creative solutions to address them. So in terms of the BOF, um, we had about 100 people in the room, 100 and something people in the room. Um, yeah, there are a lot of people there and there's general support that there is work here that is IETF appropriate. Um, a reasonable number of people who are willing to sign up to the mailing list, here's a plug, the mailing list is the mops at IETF.org mailing list. Um, we've just set it up because we've been camping out on a different mailing list until now. Um, so please do sign up if you're interested and don't be surprised if there isn't yet a lot of traffic. Um, but also an outcome is that clearly we were not clear in scoping the problem space, partly because this is not a traditional ops group for a particular protocol. So we heard that, we're willing to work with that, um, and we will um, be back with some creative solutions at some point. Uh, so just from the process, are you trying to be working group forming or what's kind of the process steps that you're trying to achieve next? Yes, this actually, this this BOF was a working group forming BOF. That, that's the intent to ultimately form a working group. So were there specific work items proposed for, 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 for the working group? So Jake, Char Jake, yeah, Jake actually has proposed that we consider doing a taxonomy of issues and of in this space to help map out the space, for instance. Um, I think that that's part of what we actually have to do in terms of clarifying what the scope would be. Yeah, because I mean, the way you, you explained it is, 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 you know, the typical thing for quote working group is kind of uh, maybe not really, it's more like a consultation group would be, you know, the another so, bigger scope of what this starts out be, right? Yeah, so we, what we really wanted was to do something like an interest group, which is why we were informally calling it a video interest group when we were meeting informally. But the problem with trying to meet informally is, 
um, you don't have bounds on your discussion, right? So no charter, no charter boundaries. And also um, no possibility of actually answering the question because he's gone off to take a call. <laughs> Shall we move on? Okay. I, I, I did want... I did want to make one point uh, in the video interest group that we ran for two years, um, and 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 the uh, the notes from it are online. The presentations that were done are online. Uh, at um, there were uh, repeatedly we ran basically like a little mini work group. So people did come and give presentations and actually have things. Hey, I'm working on stuff here that's relevant to the ITF, and this is work I'd like to do. And we have a kept having to say, well, that's awesome, but we're not a work, actual working group. Uh, but it's awesome you've got work you want to do. So there, there's a pipeline. Warren Kamari. <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, this doesn't look like a normal working group, but I don't think that's necessarily a problem, right? It's fairly clear that there are a lot of people who want to do some sort of stuff. It doesn't fall into the regular working group type design, but that doesn't mean that it's not worth doing. I think that might just be a signal that we need something else other than working groups. Um, I think for now we're going to try and leverage it into a working group because redesigning stuff and something else is a really big job. Um, I think there is some sort of precedent for this, which is things like SEC Dispatch. Right? SEC Dispatch doesn't always do its own work. It looks at things and sends them off other places, and that kind of seems like a model that we can abuse into this. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you could come back. <laughs> No, no, I think, I think that sounds great. And I wasn't meaning to, to, with the initial stuff, to reject this. I was just hoping that nobody would have said that MBOND or PIM have been, you know, nasty to people coming in from no. the outside. No. Right. So, because I'm so hoping we're not part of the yeah, problem, yeah, right, right. but really part of the solution. Um, and uh, from that perspective, if we find a way to, you know, not force this thing to unnecessarily do some stupid, you know, draft work, that's right. really just there to, and, but you sound very, uh, so, so sounds Right, cool. and so that actually uh, brings us to why we're here, because we were invited to come and tell you all about this work. And indeed, um, given this this sort of dispatch-like structure or intention of the, of the work, we could certainly see, um, we, while the MOPS might, working group might attract people to come in and talk about video challenges, uh, we could certainly vector participants to come and take actual multicast issues here for discussion amongst people who actually will be able to point them more precisely at solutions. So we're trying to be part of the, you know, helpful to other working groups. It's not about uh, stealing anybody else's lunch. Yeah, because it turns out that, you know, video and multicast kind of have things in common. <laughs> who knew? <laughs> Yeah, so that that's actually a, you know a, a, an observation I would have. It, it, it seems at times that uh, the video folks have gone taken great pains to avoid using multicast when we when they they clearly and they will state we have this problem with it's a lot of data. What a man! It's a whole lot of stuff. We got to send it everywhere. And it's like well, no, right. we do have a solution here. Um, yeah. So. Um, so yeah, we, we would love to you know play a role because we've been trying to solve a lot of these problems, and we'd like to know you know we would love to have better feedback from the relevant groups that would consume it. That is this helpful? Is this not? Is this something they're they're aware of? You know, we're right. we're you know working somewhat assiduously trying to come up with s s uh, solutions and tools to solve these problems. So. Right. So, um, I mean, this is what I threw up on, on the slide in preparation for this discussion. I'm, I'm happy to take suggestions for other bullet points. And one that, that pops to mind just now as you're describing that is, you know, we might want to make sure to have sort of a standing item depending on the scheduling of, you know, hey, the other working group is meeting later this week. Here's some topics that should be covered. Or, hey, we met earlier this week and this is what we went over that's relevant to this working group. I don't, I don't see why we couldn't do some cross, some purposeful cross pollination on the agenda, for instance. And, and don't schedule them at the same time. Okay. Yeah, that'd be we, good. We will, we're updating our, our conflict list and uh, we will definitely uh, add you guys in there. Um, I just like to add from a co chair that I see this as completely complimentary. Great. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Was that, that our last slide? I think so. Awesome. All right. Yes. Yeah, so, thank you for sharing, and we we look forward to collaborating. And cool. So, uh, first, uh, blue sheets. Has everybody signed the blue sheet? 
There's only one. It's blue sheet. We have a second one, but I don't think we need it. I think we can fit everybody on it. Trying to save blue trees. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Greg, did you want to? We, we have a little bit of time left over. Yeah, um, just, did you want to give a little bit of an update on beer, how things are going, and more specifically, what we and M Bone D should be caring about with regard to beer? Um, so I guess what I should have done was like have a slide with the RFCs and status and where we're moving. But um, I think what I want to throw out is I, I see less interested in that and more just well, sure. I mean that's a that's a chair update of the group itself. But what I'd say looking around the room of people who I don't see in the beer room, um, I think it's time to start paying attention from an ops level. There's a lot of pox taking place out there, there's a lot of discussions, some quick de early deployments. And I think we're gonna see a lot of discussion around transition mechanisms, um, uh, Goodness, uh, that's what I'm looking for is the type of, of draft that's a best practices, um, use cases, things that are starting to come out quite a bit. Um, so if nothing more, pay attention. Uh, maybe pay attention to the, the beer list itself. The use cases would be interesting to, to take a look at um, and see if you know it's well representative of what you're working on and nothing better. But uh, ops inputs are always in, 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 are, uh, valued at the protocol side. We can't just be doing this stuff in a vacuum. So pay attention, subscribe to the list, and come have fun. Okay, with that, does anybody else have it? Oh, Turles, come on down. Wait a minute, sir, what's your name? <laughs> it's like he's motivated by a need to just stir. No, no, no. Oh, yeah, know no, no I, was, I was just wondering if the context was really from M Bondi or from, from Pim earlier. But uh, so the, the, the trace route stuff is also a question of the API. So I was talking with Dan Wing. And um, so in, in the ICMP reply, the question is always depending on us how many information you get back. You always get the port number back. If you don't have uh, an API where you get more back from, from the payload, that's so it's the safest way to get the port number back, different for every packet. Otherwise, you'd have to have a nonce in the payload, and then the API needs to have sent more. So. Cool. All right, with that, uh, I guess uh, we, we are done, but you can't leave. So everybody, uh, the meeting is not over until you know 5.50, so everybody, hands folded, feet flat on the floors, eyes forward, and um, please sit in silence for the next uh, 40 minutes. But thanks for coming, we'll see you in IETF 106. Okay. We are working on this <laughs> well, no, actually, the truth has already been killed. We, we wasted that. We wasted its uh, precious life. I always felt like I don't know that it has to last longer than what might be true. Actually, as Thomas pointed out, the trees used for building for, for paper are planted solely to for paper. So not not in all cases. Depends on the, on the species. In fact, early on, the West Coast was the forest of old.